In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is risen. Christos was Christ. Christos on the earth. I'm going to break a rule. A rule I made for myself when I was only a teenager. I think I've told some of you before, but growing up as a Protestant in the church I went to, the minister there every year on Mother's Day and Father's Day would give nearly identical sermons on those days. Every Mother's Day, he would wax eloquently about the beauties of motherhood, the virtues of mothers, praise his own mother, his wife, and some other ladies in the church that he took to be great examples of maternal sacrifices, so on and so on, producing, as it were, a verbal bouquet to hand to each of the ladies to crown them with a garland of grace, so to speak. And then every Father's Day, ooh, hold on to your seats, gentlemen, he would rail against husbands for their, in the church for their laziness, for their lack of piety, for how they were failing to do things they needed to for their children, this, that, and the other, as if verbally to crack a whip over the heads of each and every one of the men in the church. And this became something of a joke between my dad and I. We go, oh, here it is again. It would be this gushing, beautiful sermon, and then whoosh, the whip on Father's Day. But given the fact that we live in a culture that sadly belittles motherhood so much, and fatherhood, I thought it might be beneficial to try in a small, small way to paint an icon of what the beauties of motherhood really are from the scriptures and from the lives of the saints. We, we have to first take note of where it is that we live in this culture that does belittle motherhood. It belittles motherhood in a variety of ways. First, our culture belittles motherhood when the men who make women mothers disrespect the glories of motherhood, the living sacrifice of motherhood, and leave those mothers to be single mothers, to do it on their own, passing the buck and the responsibility. It belittles motherhood when our culture prefers to keep women, and everyone else really, as atomized individuals, not as members of families or communities, the better to feed off the passions for things, for desires, for purchasing items, to make us happy consumers. It belittles motherhood when our culture promotes what it holds up as a sort of joyous and carefree lifestyle supposedly offered by birth control and protection from the all-terrifying and terrible baby. Finally, it belittles motherhood when our culture has institutionalized and promotes a practice that turns a mother's natural instincts for love, for care, and protection towards her child and tells her, it's not a child. It's a choice, and you can do with it as you would with any other part of your body, as easily as you would color your hair or paint your nails. In this and many other ways, sadly, our culture belittles the great vocation of motherhood. But what does our scriptures, what does our tradition, what do our saints tell us about the great glory of motherhood? I start with the words from the book of Proverbs. A good wife, who can find... She is more precious than jewels. She is the heart, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Now these words from the book of Proverbs frame this rhetorical question about the difficulty of finding a virtuous wife and mother, not because women are poor specimens of virtue or morality, but because there is such a high bar set by the great and exalted vocation of motherhood and of marriage. And this is no less the case for men, but we'll get to them in a few weeks, don't you worry. The women, the woman then who lives up to and fulfills this vocation that the scripture would lay forth will hear the resounding praise of her husband and children as the proverb says, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also praises her saying, many women have done excellently but you have surpassed them all. What though is the great vocation of motherhood? How have the Holy Scriptures portrayed it to us? 
And what shining examples can we look to today from the life and history of the church as guides in this vocation? Now, throughout Scripture, motherhood is an unquestionable blessing. From the very beginning, from our first mother, Eve, who received her name, Eve in Hebrew meaning living, because she was to be the mother of all living, and eventually, through her descendant, the mother of the living one, who would come into, uh, and into the flesh and would incarnate and bring about our salvation. But down through the centuries, over and over again, the women who suffered from barrenness sought, by the grace of God, to be granted the grace of being able to bear children into the world. And so we look through the Old Testament and see the prophetess Hannah, the mother of Samuel, <coughs> Sarah, the wife of Abraham, who in her old age brought Isaac into the world, Rachel, the wife of Isaac's son Jacob, who for many years was unable to bear children and rejoiced when her sons Joseph and Benjamin were born. And finally, all the way down to the New Testament with the holy Anna, the wife of Joachim, the mother of the Theotokos, and Elizabeth, the wife of Zacharias, the mother of the forerunner, who for some time were unable to have children, and when they did, they burst forth with joy. Now this, first off, should call us to think, if the scriptures take it for granted that motherhood is such a great and blessed and glorious thing, what do we do with the world around us that seems to think so otherwise? It is precisely this having children, which the church and scriptures hold as a blessing, that the world seems to think is a limiting factor for women, limiting on their accomplishments in this life. The profound power, though, simply to bring new life into the world, which only a mother and only as a woman can yield, or sorry, only a woman as a mother can yield. In normal circumstances, it brings new persons into existence, and in the highest and most exalted moment of that, it brought our very Lord and God and Savior in the flesh into this world so that he may bring about our salvation. Who could possibly belittle this? Who could possibly belittle this? As a contemporary uh, American Catholic woman philosopher, her name Alice von Hildebrand said, responding to the extreme feminist Simone de Beauvoir's claim that women make nothing in her time saying, women don't have the power and authority in the places in the business world and so forth that men had, Alice von Hildebrand said, when the time has come, nothing which is man-made will exist. One day, all human accomplishments will be reduced to a pile of ashes. And that's everything, from the great pyramids the Roman uh, arches, the, the tower, the Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty, anything that we think of as the greatest achievements of culture will fall to the ashes. But every single child to whom a woman has given birth will live forever, for he has been given an immortal soul made in the image and likeness of God. But the mother's role does not end simply with bringing a child into the world, but continues with raising the child. As St. John Chrysostom says, having children is a matter of nature. Raising them and educating them in virtue and piety is a matter of the mind and the will. A mother obviously then must play a very important role in raising her children, in forming them. As Solomon says in the book of Proverbs, he tells the readers, Heed the wisdom and instruction that your mother has given you, for they are a garland of grace, a garland of grace about your neck. And elsewhere instructing parents, he says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Yet here again, sadly, our culture belittles this very exalted vocation that is granted to parents in the formation of their children, trying to convince parents that on the one hand they are either not capable of providing their children with a proper education or formation or socialization or whatever other aspect of formation they need growing up, and therefore this ought to be outsourced to daycares and schools and community centers and uh, social organizations and so forth, 
or on the other hand, convincing parents and mothers among them that they should really pass off their children so that they can pursue the broader pursuits of worldly education and business and so forth. Yet here again, what greater accomplishment, what broader accomplishment could there be than to raise a child to form his or her mind, will, and heart? To turn again to the words of a more modern uh, thinker, uh, some, someone you may know, the English writer G.K. Chesterton. And he said, babies need not to be taught a trade, but to be introduced to the world. To put the matter shortly, a woman is generally in the house with a human being at the time when he asks all the questions that there are and some that there aren't. I can understand how this may exhaust the mind. What I cannot imagine is how it could ever narrow it. How can it be a large career to teach other people's children a few academic subjects, but a small career to tell one's children about the universe? How can it be broad to be the same thing to everyone and yet everything to someone? No, a woman's function is definitely laborious, but it is because it is gigantic, not because it is minute. I will pity Miss Jones for the hugeness of her task. I will never pity her for its smallness. But a mother's vocation does not end there, brothers and sisters, with simply giving birth or raising a child in this life, but continues for parents are called in the Orthodox Church not simply to bring children into the world, not simply to provide them with education and jobs, but to be co-laborers with God in the raising and production of sons and daughters of God. Now this is where I will leave off on my own words and invoke instead the examples of the lives of a number of saints. Because we need role models, we need people to look up to, and sadly the ones that are given to us by our culture, specifically on the TV, whether they be the ideal mothers of the halcyon days of the June Cleavers, and the Carolyn Brady's, or maybe some of the more degenerates of Roseanne, Marge Simpson, and so forth. And I'm sorry, I stopped watching TV after college, so I don't know which ones are out there now, and they're probably no better. But we say, and there's a common saying, that behind every great man stands a great woman. Well, I would tell you that behind every one of the great saints of our church has usually stood a great mother. And I want to share with you about three that we are commemorating in this coming week. First, I want to tell you about St. Emilia. St. Emilia, who was the mother of St. Basil the Great. In case you don't know, this guy. Right here, on the doors of the uh, royal doors, the author of one of the liturgies that we serve, the author of many great patristic works, one of the greatest church fathers, St. Emilia. We don't know a lot about St. Amelia's early life. We know that she was born and raised in uh, the area that we would typically call Asia Minor or Turkey today, somewhere near the end of the third century into the fourth century. But we do know a few things about her upbringing. First off, she was the daughter of a martyr. Can you imagine the focus in your faith that it would cause to have a parent who was willing to lay down their life and to die for the sake of Christ. And secondly, she was the daughter-in-law of St. Macrina the Elder, who was a great saint and who instructed her much in the art of mothering. Now she and her husband, Basil the Elder, it gets confusing in the family. They sort of had a lot of the same names passed down from generation to generation, but St. Basil the Great's father was also named Basil. Her husband and she had 10, 10 children. She raised them all in the faith, zealously instructing them on how to pray, how to fast, how to give alms, what Christians believe, to teach them the Holy Scriptures, so on and so forth. And whatever she did, it worked. Because of her ten children, the church recognizes five of them as saints. These are Saints Macrina the Younger, Saint Basil the Great, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, St. Peter of Sebasti and Theosevia, and of those, three of them were bishops. So she gave the church a great heritage. 
Now, when I read of saints like this, a mother who imparts the faith to their children, I think of some of the contemporary elders, most notably one that was very close to me, uh, Father Roman Braga, the Romanian priest who suffered in the communist prisons. He tells often, in, in, if you read his book, of when he was growing up, his mother each night, she, had, um, she was very pious. She would actually, instead of spanking them as children, she would give them the Psalter and say, go read a cathisma in the, in the prayer corner. And her, him and his brothers would actually start to do things a little naughty because they liked this. And they would you know, get a chance to go read the Psalms. But his mother, every night when he was a baby, would lay him down in his cradle and begin to read the, midnight, or the, the evening prayers. And he was, his cradle was right under the icon corner. And he would slowly drift off to sleep while she prayed. And then in the morning, she would already be up praying the morning prayers as he woke up. Well, in his mind, she hadn't stopped. She'd been praying there all night over him. But that's a beautiful image of the prayer that we ought to have and the, the prayer that we ought to uh, impart to our children. And so St. Emilia is a great example to us of how to impart the faith to our children, to raise them in the church. <clears throat> a second mother who we'll be commemorating this week, St. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine. Hers was a slightly different story. She did not come from a Christian background, live in a Christian marriage, and raise a Christian family. Instead, she grew up, she was a Christian herself, but was married to a Roman pagan official named Patricius, who, while he respected her Christian piety, her almsgiving, never converted to the faith himself, and we have every indication that he was actually not very faithful to her throughout their marriage. A very difficult life she led. She raised two sons and one daughter, among whom was St. Augustine, but due to her husband's stubborn insistence, she was refused permission to baptize them as children. St. Augustine was almost baptized while a boy because he fell deathly ill, and his father almost gave in to his, in to his wife's pleading, but when he started to mend, he said, nope, if he wants to do it when he's older, he can, but otherwise, he'll have to wait. Now, his mother was greatly pleased to see that his health began to return, but unfortunately, she was worried as she saw him grow up to turn away from the faith that she had tried to raise him in and to begin to embark upon a life of sinfulness, following his father's example instead of his mother's. When he went off to begin his formal studies, St. Augustine not only gave in to the licentiousness and laziness that might be characteristic of your uh, contemporary college fraternity, fraternity life, but he also went further and began to embrace the heretical teachings of the Manichaeans and openly kept a mistress. All of this pained his mother's heart desperately, yet she never stopped praying and weeping for her son even though it seemed that it was against hope that she could ever hope to see him come around. Now, St. Augustine records much of this in his book, The Confessions, and how once she had a conversation with a spiritual father, a bishop whose name is unknown to us, and she poured out her mother's heart for her son, rent with grief, all her worries that he would never turn around. And that delightful bishop, that holy man, said to her, Calm yourself. Have peace. A child of such tears will never perish. A child of such tears will never perish. Well, in time, thanks be to God, after 17 years of adolescent rebellion, uh, resistance to the faith, St. Augustine turned around, and through the, uh, ins the, the instrumental work of St. Ambrose of Milan, he himself became a Christian, and we know him as one of the greatest examples of repentance in the history of the church, a great saint, and a writer of many theological works. And so we can see in St. Monica a great example of a Christian mother of a wayward child who longs and prays and weeps and mourns for her son or her daughter that they will return to the faith. Finally, I want to tell you of the mother of a saint that we commemorate today, St. Akakios, the slipper maker, as he was known. St. Akakios lived in what is now Greece, but was at that time part of the Turkish Empire during the 1800s. And at that time, Christians living under the Turks lived in a status that was called vimitude. 
It's a second-class citizenship. Some of the rules that were applied to this were Christians were not allowed to express religious uh, practices in public. You couldn't wear a cross that was visible. You could not do any sort of prayers or any church services in public. They were not allowed to build new churches, and they had a decreased or diminished legal standing in the courts. But what got to St. Ikakios was that many Christians had a great difficult time in the business world. They either had to take employment under Turkish uh, employers who were very harsh to them, could beat them, could treat them ill, and there was no, they were above the law, there was no problem with that. And secondly, the Christians had a great tax imposed on them called the jizya. And this tax was basically like an extortion. As long as you paid it, the Muslims would not carry out jihad against you. If you stopped paying it, you had two choices, convert or be imprisoned, enslaved, or put to death. Well, finally, he gave in. He couldn't take it anymore. He converted to Islam. He thought this would be a way of bettering his place in society. He'd get ahead in the business world. He'd get the education he'd always want. He'd have all those successes that people are always looking for for their children. Thanks be to God, he came to his senses and repented. He went to Mount Athos. He lived there as a monk for some time in repentance. And his mother found out where he had gone. And she wrote a letter to him. And I want to read to you what she said. She wrote to him and said, My dear son, as you have willingly and publicly denied your faith in the Lord, you must now willingly and bravely confess your faith in Christ, bravely accepting martyrdom for the sake of our sweetest Lord Jesus. Now, we could imagine her saying something very otherwise. You know, it's, it's hard in the, this world. I know you had to make some compromises, but at least you have a good job now. At least you got this education. At least you're making it in the world. But her ultimate concern was not that he make it in this world, but that he make it in the next. And so she called on her son to make an open confession of Christ, which was a certain death sentence at that time. And so he did. He received the blessing of his spiritual father. He prepared himself by prayer and fasting. He went to the city of Constantinople, and in the public, in the midst of everyone, he renounced the faith in Muhammad, the faith of Muhammad in Allah, and instead in confessed himself to be a Christian. And he was beheaded for that on this day 201 years ago. And this is the mother who saw that her ultimate concern was not for the things of this world for her son, but for the things of the next life. And so we can see then that we must ourselves struggle to regain a proper image of the greatness of the vocation of motherhood, the blessing of having children, the great duty of raising them, educating them, training them in virtue, and ultimately leading them by example or through heart-wrenching prayer and at times by a firm rebuke to see that their ultimate goal, their ultimate purpose in life is not just to be a good son or daughter, but a son and daughter of God. I pray and I hope that God will bless each and every one of you mothers, grandmothers, godmothers, and those who simply are mothers in your concern for the lives of others around you on this day. Oh, and P.S., guys, don't worry, I'm coming for you in a few weeks.